May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As Andrew mentioned, the, the heading under which Macmillan uh, encouraged people to do what I did last week um, is Bray the Shed. And uh, a number of people before and since said to me, oh, that was a very brave thing to do. The reality, of course, uh, is that uh, my bravery of simply having my head shaved is nothing compared to the bravery of those uh, who do it uh, because it's forced upon them by their illness. Um, but also, actually, uh, when I assess my motives for doing what I did last Sunday, um, the truth is um, I partly did it for me um, in thinking about my motivation. Um, and this I'm sure you'll understand. When someone you love is sick and there's nothing you can do about it, of course, you can care for them and pray with them, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of what's happening to them, that you, you feel very helpless. Uh, and I realized that actually I was, I was probably a big part of me with doing what I did last week because I just felt a need to do something. Uh, and that, that this, this, was, this was an active thing that I could do. Uh, and I confess that in that respect, um, it actually, it made me feel better simply doing it. Um, and I'm sure those of you uh, who've, who've had loved ones who are going through some kind of serious illness, I'm sure you will understand that, that feeling of helplessness, the, the inability to, you know, you desperately want to do something to help them. Uh, and yet, of course, apart from praying, which of course is very important, and being there for them, you can't actually do anything about what it is that they're going through, and that 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 feeling of helplessness uh, is is one of the hardest things about being the carer or the loved one of someone who is ill. Of course, that's not the only circumstance in our lives uh, when we feel like that. I think it's a particular one, having never really gone through it before uh, up until this moment. Uh, my parents were ill, but but somehow with my wife, it, it seems even more intense. Um, uh, but there, are, of course, there are other circumstances where we go through those same feelings that we're made redundant, stuff happens to us in our lives beyond our control. We can have that feeling of, of helplessness, of kind of you know, what's going on, and, and, I, and I'm just being blown along by whatever it is. Of course, we can also feel those feelings uh, when the world, when big things are happening in the world, which clearly are beyond our control. And uh, there have been times in all our lives, I'm sure, when world events have made us have that feeling. My goodness, this is, this is a momentous thing that's, that's affecting everybody. And, you know, I'm a small, insignificant person. There is nothing I can do about it. And a, and a, and a feeling of, of confusion and being caught up in chaos might uh, ensue. And we all might have been feeling a little bit like that uh, this year with the war in the Ukraine, uh, with very visible signs of climate change, with rising prices, et cetera, et cetera. With just this week, um, our fourth prime minister in just six years, we, we were probably already feeling uh, a little bit uh, as if life was out of control and the world was spinning uh, uncontrollable. And then, of course, on Thursday, these feelings were, were, were very much uh, amplified by the loss of arguably the most visible sign of consistency and continuity that, that most of us have had in our lives, the loss of our Queen. Uh, and those feelings, not just, of course, because she was our monarch, but because for 90% for of us, she is the only monarch that we have known. Uh, and even for those perhaps old enough to remember the previous king, uh, most of your lives too uh, have been under the reign of Her Majesty. She, she has been our queen through half the last century and all of this one. She is a visible connection to back to the Second World War, to a different life, a different age. She connects us as a community and as a country. And so the loss of her on top of everything else may well have amplified 
those feelings of chaos. Not the only time in our lives, perhaps, that you have felt like that. Other events, I'm, I'm slightly too, old, too young to remember the assassination of President Kennedy, things like that. Events where people say, yes, of course, I remember where I was when I first heard the news, when that happened. I will probably always remember that moment on Thursday evening when Diane came to the kitchen and said, it, she's dead, she's dead. You know, that, that moment will be with me. Uh, but there are other moments in my life also. Today uh, is the anniversary of such a moment. 21 years ago on this very day, uh, the 11th of September, um, two planes were flown into the towers of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center uh, and another plane flown into the Pentagon. I suspect most of us will remember, those of us old enough to remember, uh, will remember that moment when we first heard that news, when we first saw those pictures uh, on the television 21 years ago today. And no doubt many of us had similar feelings as, as on that moment and over the, the, the week and days that followed, the realization of just what a momentous event that was and, and the effect that it would have on the world. And of course, uh, we are still feeling that effect today. What's happening in Afghanistan, what's happening in Iraq, those, those things are still uh, rolling on from what happened then. And the relationship between different faiths and religions and all other things changed on that day. And that, that moment was one that we remember and one which may have given us similar feelings of, uh, of confusion, of lack of control, uh, of, of fear and of worry. The writer uh, of the letter, of, of the, the book of Ecclesiastes, um, uh, felt similar feelings. Uh, it's a book which is full uh, of someone's acts, of someone writing to say that, they, that they, they don't feel in control of their lives. Famous line, vanity, vanity, all is vanity, is repeated many times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, perhaps better translated as meaningless. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Through the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, we, 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 we share the writer's acts. We hear his attempts to, to cope with his feelings. The uh, one part of the book, he, he gives up. He just says, well, if everything's meaningless, there's no point carrying on. There's no point doing it. And another part of the book, he, he goes for hedonism. Uh, he says, well, you know, if, if life is meaningless, I might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow I die. He tries all these different things, but none of them work. Now, it may seem strange to have a book in the Bible which has such, uh, such disillusion, such feelings of angst within it. But strangely, many people at times of feeling the same, rather than feeling this is the last thing they want to hear, have actually been encouraged by the book of Ecclesiastes. One of the wonderful things about the Bible, one of the wonderful things about our faith in particular, is that it really meets up with the realities of life. It recognizes that, that, that despite what we claim to believe in our faith, that nevertheless we recognize, accept that life is often messy, uh, confusing, short, full of pain, uh, and often un unable to be understood. And the Bible recognizes and accepts the realities of life. And the book of Ecclesiastes probably more than any other book reflects that reality. But what we see through the book as the writer uh, struggles with this feeling that, that life is chaotic and feeling his own personal lack of control and helplessness, uh, is that eventually he begins to realize that despite his own day-to-day -day struggles, week to week, the lack of any kind of meaning, actually, overall, there is, there is purpose, there is a pattern. And in that famous passage that we heard just, just read, that to everything there is a season, there is a time for war and a time for peace, a time for life and a time for death, or there is a time for joy, a time for dance, and a time for despair. 
Now, to be clear, the writer is not saying that these are all good things, not saying that, yes, God wants there to be war sometimes, or God wants there to be bad things sometimes, and also not preaching a kind of predestination, not saying this happens then because God ordains it to happen then. What the writer is saying is they recognise that these things are inevitable. These things will happen, but nevertheless, as sure as war follows peace, peace follows war. As surely as death follows life, life follows death. As surely as night follows day, summer follows spring. That, that there is a pattern, there is a rhythm. And although sometimes it seems strange and we struggle to understand it, and though sometimes uh, in the depths of the struggle and the chaos, we wonder where God is. Nevertheless, actually, what life shows us is that there is a pattern, there is, there is purpose and meaning, even though we find it hard to discern. In the film um, Cast Company, Tom Hanks works for FedEx, and, uh, and he's very, very good at his job because he is a very, very organized person. He is the ideal person to be in charge of a division of FedEx uh, and to be in charge of all the rotors uh, and the delivery times and all, all that kind of very detailed, controlled planning that is necessary for a delivery company. Um, he is the ideal person for that because he is an incredibly organized and controlled person. Those of you who've seen the film will know that he's on a FedEx flight which crashes and he ends up marooned on a desert island. Uh, and uh, as is his personality and his nature, he, he thinks, right, how am I going to deal with this? What, what do I need to do? Builds uh, a shelter, uh, learns how to fish, he, all this kind of stuff. He plans to his escape, tries to build a boat, etc., etc., etc. His, his, his controlled uh, work ethic personality carries on and kicks in. But as the months and months and ultimately years and years go by, he starts to lose heart. Things happen to him that he can't do anything about. He gets sick, he can't do anything about it. He realises that because of the tides and all the rest of it, he cannot build a boat himself and a swim from the island. And eventually, he lapses into despair and even becomes suicidal. But he passes through that and he does recover and he does eventually escape. And uh, towards the end of the film, he says this, the moment when I realised that I could control nothing, that I had no power, had no control, that, that realisation and that acceptance came over me like a warm blanket. And I realized that whilst there seemed to be no meaning or purpose to things, nevertheless, I had to stay alive. I had to carry on breathing because tomorrow the sun would rise and who knows what the tide would bring in. The realization, the acceptance that we cannot control it rather than bitterly raging against the night, is actually the way that we gain peace. The serenity of accepting the things that we cannot change. The realisation that yes, life is beyond our control, and yet within it there is a pattern and a certainty. Tomorrow the sun will rise is a source of comfort. The writer of Ecclesiastes, towards the end of the book, recognises this and says that actually the way that he has found, the best way he has found of coping is by enjoying life and by helping others, which is an interesting comment. And so I think when we have these things, as we have them this week and perhaps for some time, um, that that's, that's the beginning, that's the first step. The realisation rather than uh, trying to organise our lives even more, take more control over our lives in a vain hope uh, that we can overcome these feelings of helplessness, is to actually accept and try to be comfortable with the recognition that we cannot control it anything. Yes, we are small and insignificant, and we can have little effect on world events, 
But that isn't a reason to give up. That's actually a reason to try and enjoy and embrace life all the more. Life is short and often hard and often under, unable to be understood. Um, but yet all the more reason to recognize what a wonderful gift it is, the very fact that we are alive at all, and to try to enjoy it and embrace it and be grateful for the gifts that we have, but also then to work to make the world a better place, to do good, as the writer to Ecclesiastes says. And for me, in our current circumstances, three things in particular come out of that. The importance of community, the importance of service, and the importance of faith. Three things which I believe Her Majesty embodied. She embodied the stability and the sense of connection throughout our community. She embodied service and servant, and she embodied faith. Uh, she was a woman of genuine Christian faith. That was incredibly evident, and she was not ashamed to declare that and proclaim it, uh, despite or perhaps because of her position as our monarch. And we, and we should try and embody those things too. That's how we cope with our, her loss, by embodying uh, those things that she witnessed and gave us as an example in her life. Community, because we cope so much better with things when we are together than when we are alone. She recognised that. She, she recognised that it, it wasn't really about her as a person, about her as Elizabeth. It was about her as a symbol of the unity of our country and of our community. We mourn her together, not because she was my queen or your queen, but because she was our queen. Queen. And so we come together today uh, connecting with each other because of that shared feeling and by, uh, and by remembering together and sharing our grief together as the country will do over the next 10 days, we actually strengthen ourselves as a country and cope better with our sense of loss. So community is vitally important. Secondly, service. It's all very well to say, well, community is important. But we have to do something individually to strengthen and to help the, that sense of community. And one of the key ways we can do that is by making the small differences we can in our own local communities. The importance of caring for our neighbours and looking after those in need. The, the, the importance of serving our community and recognising that, that the strength of a worldwide community starts in our own community. Serving our community, serving our neighbours is an important way uh, of coping with, with a sense of chaos in the wider world. And thirdly, faith. Of course, the recognition that empires come and go, monarchs live and die. Things will change. That is inevitable. That is largely beyond our control. And yet, we have a constant God who is unchanging, the source of our ultimate strength and stability. And the Queen absolutely recognised that and embodied that. And of course, out of our faith comes the recognition or the double enforcement of the importance of the other two things. Our faith is a communal faith. Yes, our relationship with God as an individual is important, but actually, God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. Uh, it's that, that sense of a shared faith, of working together to build the kingdom of God is so important. And of course, out of that comes the need for service. Jesus absolutely embodied servant, servant kingship, just as the Queen did in our gospel reading. Jesus says, I have come to give sight to the blind, release to the captive. And that is both a, in a spiritual sense, the freedom that can come with saying, God, I can't cope. I, you know, but I recognize I can place my trust in you. I place my life in your hands. I, I, I let go of the control of my life and give it to you. That's, that's the spiritual freedom that Jesus is talking about in Luke chapter 4. But he's also talking about literally releasing captives, literally helping the blind, the sick, the lame, the poor. 
Uh, and so we need to be part of that as well. So our, our faith both gives us strength in itself, but also through the strength we find that our faith gives to our sense of community and our need to serve others. In 2006, I was in New York. Uh, and I remember it was October 2006 because I was there with my middle daughter and it was her 15th birthday while we were there. Um, and uh, as well as going to a Broadway show and going up the Empire State Building, et cetera, et cetera, we went to Ground Zero. It was five years after the attacks in 2001. Um, uh, and even though it was five years later, um, actually the, the site was still one. I mean, there was building work going on, but it, it was it, there was still a sense of desolation there. There was a small memorial that had been, been built, but the, the, the major memorial was yet to be completed. And, and, uh, and, and that was pretty much all there was, a building site and a, and a memorial on the pavement in front of where it happened. Um, uh, and, and we looked around and just behind us was a little church. Uh, and so we, we went into it. And the church is St. Paul's Chapel, New York, built in 1766. And it's the oldest church uh, in New York, one of the oldest churches in the United States of America. It, it is literally just across the road from where uh, the World Trade Center was. Uh, and yet it was completely undamaged by the collapse of the towers. If you look, if you look at pictures, if you Google it, you'll see pictures. The, the graveyard is full of ash and debris. Uh, and you know there's the, the yawning gap behind where the towers used to stand. And yet this little church, this little chapel stands undamaged. It's little spire stands there undamaged and it's known by new yorkers as the little chapel that stood <laughs> and so we went in that day we didn't know this at the time but we went in uh, and and what we found in there were um, memorials and displays to what had happened five years earlier still there uh, at that time uh, and uh, also um, boards telling us about what that church did and what it stood for at that time because not only did it become a uh, a symbol of survival uh, in the face of overwhelming chaos, but actually it then became a centre uh, for, for rescue and support because it was so close to the site. Um, thousands, literally thousands of firemen and uh, doctors and uh, emergency services used it as a base, literally thousands over a period, not just of those initial stages of days, but over the weeks ahead as the, as the operation carried on. Um, and, and to support those people, the local community came, not just the members of that church, uh, although they kind of helped coordinate it, but, but local people of all faiths and none came and became part of the support team to look after the firemen, etc., and support workers who were there. And, uh, and one of the most powerful things for me was that the pews in the church uh, are all painted white. It's one of those, you know, old American chapels where, where everything's white, including uh, the, the pews. And, but on the backs of the pews were all these black marks and scrapes. And um, what the sign there said was that those were the marks of the boots of the fire who slept on the pews during the kind of, you know, 24 hour service that they were having to do during those early stages. And they left those parts there deliberately as a sign of the service of those firemen and of those who supported them. So for me, that, that little chapel became, well, not just for me, but for many, that chapter becomes a symbol of those, those three things that I've just mentioned. A symbol of community as it was the ordinary people who lived around came to serve and to help. Uh, a symbol of, of active service, those, those firemen, those support workers, and those who then supported them, individuals coming to do what they could in the face of extreme chaos. And of course, as a church, as the little chapel that stood, a symbol of how faith can help us survive in the face of apparent overwhelming chaos. That little church symbolised that for 
our queen symbolized that to us for decades and decades and decades. And it's by trying to live out and embody those three things, importance of community, importance of service, and importance of faith, that we will both honor her memory, but also help to continue her legacy. I'd like to finish uh, with a short but well-known prayer um, from Reinhold Niebuhr. God, please give us the serenity to cope with the things we cannot change. Please give us the strength to change the things we can. And please give us the wisdom to know the difference. Amen.